Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Bina 007 Movie Reviews. The big review of the week is Star Wars The Last Jedi and to review that I'm joined by my friend Patrick, also known as Sir Patrick the Tall, on the Vassals of Kingsgrave podcast, which is a community hosted podcast I often contribute to. It covers all manner of geeky and nerdy things, so if you want to hear me discuss stuff that isn't movie related, I would encourage you to go there, check out vokpodcast.wordpress.com. After Patrick and I discuss Star Wars in full spoiler detail, I am then going to give a quick review of actually another film starring Mark Hamill that's out right now called Brigsby Bear, and then round out with a quick review of the film Stronger, which is about the Boston Marathon bombing survivor, Jeff Bauman. Okay, so here's a clip of the new Star Wars film to get us going on the show. Now, reach out. What do you see? Light. Darkness. And something else. It's calling me. Resist it, Ray. This has been a 007, and I'm joined by Patrick. Hello, Patrick the Tall. And we're here to discuss um, The Last Jedi. So can you just quickly let me know what your thoughts were? Because I don't know if you're positive, negative, in between. It seems to be a very divisive edition. Mm, it, it definitely was. I think I was mainly one of the, mo- the most staunch supporters of... Well, yeah, of of the choices. I mean, I understand why people think that some of these things are out of place and stuff, but I I generally enjoyed it, and I think that it 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 does very well what I think it's supposed to do, which is introduce uh, stores or like introduce new characters as the main characters from now on. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I agree. We're in a transitional phase, aren't we? Where some of the old characters yeah. need to be pensioned off and the new ones brought to the forefront. So I agree exactly. with that. How do you rate it compared to the Force Awakens and Rogue One, so the sort of the new Disney era Star Wars? Oh yeah, well I, I would definitely do um, Rogue One as my favorite, uh, then this one, and then uh, Force Awakens as my least favorite one. Okay, so for me it's the same. Like Rogue One is definitely my favorite. It may well be my favorite film including Empire. I just think it's so dark. It's so lovely to see a film without Skywalkers and lightsabers. That's a great film to me. And I think in a sense that probably set me up for a fall with this one because nothing was going to be as good as that for me. I really had a great time watching The Force Awakens, but I think in retrospect felt it was so fan servicey. But mm. I, I got why, because I think the prequels were so bad, they kind of had to earn back our love. <laughs> maybe, yeah. <laughs> and I think in The Force Awakens, they showed they loved it as much as we did, almost maybe too much. Um, mm. And so I was really looking forward to this one because I felt it'll be interesting to see if they push it forward into new territory. And they totally did that, right? So mm. I can't criticize it for that. <laughs> 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 to me, it was like I did enjoy it. I did not enjoy it. It wasn't the overwhelming positive experience I had with Force Awakens and Rogue One. And mm. there were real jump the shark moments that really took me out of the film and even while watching it the first time rather than being immersed in it I was like analyzing hmm Mm. this is an interesting choice this provokes me let me think about why I like that and I just feel that I love a film that's intelligent enough to do that to me but I don't want that to happen during the film in the film I should be Mm. Star Wars and wrapped up in it Um, but should we get to some of the points of controversy and that'll you can maybe explain to me what I'm getting wrong. I'm not. I'm not going to explain to you what you're getting wrong. That's the wrong <laughs> attitude. <laughs> well, I'm pleased for that actually, because so many people have been sending me articles written in d- different magazines trying to kind of explain the black backlash or explain to me why I haven't gotten it, and that's yeah. almost like more annoying than than what I didn't like in the film. <laughs> I mean, it's basically useless to to try to move people's point of view without it being like something they want to do themselves, you know, explore new territory. So yeah. in, that, in that sense, I don't never really enjoy <laughs> explaining stuff to people, uh, so to say, why they need to like a thing. 
I but agree. yeah. But let's, we can go through the different plot strands, and I guess. Yeah, basically, yeah. Talk about think... it. So I think that's kind of, I was trying to split this up. I think there's four separate things going on here. Yeah. So the first one is probably um, kind of in the order of how it's introduced, is the space battle between the First Order and what remains mm. of the Resistance. Because as we open, or rather at the end of The Force Awakens, Coruscant has been destroyed by the Starkiller base. So when we open this film, we've got to assume that the, Re- the Republic is gone. And they're chasing what remains of the resistance fleet, which is running out of fuel. We discover they can track people through through light speed, which is kind mm. of weird and new, but cool. We get a really cool new ship. I love the Dreadnought. Mm. I, I love seeing the tech evolve. I lo- that is, to me, the best of Star Wars. Oh, my God, it's a new ship. It looks so awesome. Mm. And you get this brilliant slow motion chase through space. And it's setting us up for a lesson that Poe has to go through because he starts off as his hero jock. And he has to understand that sometimes courage and heroism is about humility and not caring what people think about you and making a sacrifice. So he does that in opposition to Leia and to Vice Admiral Holdo. And mm. I have to say, I loved that opening scene. Yeah. I loved the character of Paige. And I was really, even the second time I watched it, I was on the edge of my seat. Like, is she going to get that remote control to set off the bombs? <laughs> mm. um, and so, I, and I really liked that storyline that Poe could be made from this one dimensional pilot into something Mm. more serious the only thing i felt in that is um you know like and this is just because he's my all-time favorite minor character is admiral akbar and i felt he Uh. he just got like this really lame death off screen and i just felt maybe he should have gone down either piloting one of the fleet ships so he could have a a sacrificial death like that befits his life but why Mm. couldn't he have played the holdo character i mean i've got nothing against laura dern but i just felt that would have been a fitting death for him yeah that's a very valid uh, opinion to have i think that uh the only thing i i would say against that is that it would be difficult for admiral agbar to express all the emotions that hold holdo expresses because during... he doesn't he has a rubber mask rather than a yeah face. actually yeah maybe that's true maybe that's a good counterpoint um but anyway, maybe because, you know, there's the there's the captain of the ship, not the medical frigate, but there's another one where they manage to get the people off and he stays on it and gets killed. Mm. And yeah. I think that would have been a good death rack bar. Put him on a secondary ship, have him save the lives of the people by staying on and then go. Um, Definitely. I can it's a minor that. point, though. It's a totally minor point. That one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, lo- I love that scene. I love that whole storyline. I think the secondary storyline that it spawns, which is the one where Poe sends Finn and Rose, who I loved as a new character, off to Canto Bite. And they meet the the code breaker played by Benicio del Toro because there's this kind of like totally convoluted plot whereby they need to get the code breaker because they need to get on the Imperial ship because they need to deactivate the light speed tracker so that everyone can get away. But they don't really need to get away anyway because they're going to a rebel base. But Poe doesn't know that. Mm. Um, Like, what did you think of all that? Like, did you like Rose? Did you like the Canto bite scenes? They seem to be like some of the most controversial, I would say. Well, I don't mind can- the counterbite scenes. I think that it it did uh, give us a sort of a break right after all the uh, the death and and disparity that was in uh, in that first you know scene between the first order and uh, and the resistance. So I like that that they got, kind of got us give us a respite there. But uh, I controversially am not as interested in Rose as a character. Um, oh, interesting. Just because she's I mean, she's basically too too cute. Like she's uh, her whole stick is being cute and and uh, being the moral compass, right? Uh, yeah, and this is the problem that I I think the actress that plays Rose I really liked. Yeah. I like the fact that she's powerful and delivers a powerful message, but she has this very delicate voice, and mm. it's a different kind of heroine rather than like Ray, who's very active. You know, it's a mm. very, she's more passive, and I like that. But she makes this very bold choice at the end to ram Finn off, which I really loved. Mm. But I agree with you that there's an element to both Holdo and to Rose where they're just that movie trope of these women who exist purely to teach men a lesson. So Holdo mm. exists absolutely purely to teach Poe about the nature of true leadership. Mm. And basically Rose exists to give Finn maybe a love interest and to teach him that rather than giving in to the cynicism that the codebreaker might have inspired into in him mm. and hatred 
he needs to live and live for love and for the light side of the force. That's all the reason for Rose to exist. And in a series with so many cool female characters like Leia, like Rey, it's kind of like, yeah, they still can't quite escape that, you know, wise woman existing to teach, suffering women that teach the hero to be a better hero character. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I just don't enjoy that specifically. I wouldn't even, even enjoy having a man, male character that was... You know, I don't enjoy paladin characters, basically. That's the kind of characters I don't enjoy. The ones who are uh, morally centered and, and always will do the right thing, even even if they try to, like, with story, try to give you, like, a lure you into a trap thinking something else, they still turn out to be the, the moral compass of the story. And always I don't like good, that. Always good, always right. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with you. And that maybe nicely brings us to the third plot strand, which is Luke and Rey, because I guess Luke was that character in the early films, the paladin character. Yeah. And now he's in despair and he's closed himself off from the force. And he acknowledges that Jedi have always failed training people that are very powerful force users and keeping them away from the dark side. Mm. And I really like that, actually. I I like that he's cynical and Mm. that he also has a lesson to learn. And Yoda, I, I guess, teaches him that lesson. Um, that failure is okay, that there's a teaching moment, quote-unquote, in that. Um, yeah. How did you feel about that? Because I think a lot of the fans have freaked out that Luke's in despair, basically. Yeah, I think that's what I've also found out later on, that a lot of people don't like that he's actually been shown to be human, basically. Um, and um, I, as well, as a fan of, of Victor George R. R. Martin's uh universe i think that's basically what drew me into that that these characters because characters could be three-dimensional and can make mistakes and then still be uh good guys in the end after they get out of their whatever crisis they have so that's totally uh, acceptable and maybe one of the best things of this this film yeah i love it and i think that it would almost be psychopathic if if you train your nephew and he turns to the dark side and kills all your other Jedi pupils. It would almost be bizarre not to have that reaction. Yeah. And I always think it's weird when you look back on it in retrospect that the kind of, you know, the fluffy, happy Alec Guinness Obi-Wan isn't mm. more scarred by what has happened with Anakin. And that's probably because, you know, George hadn't worked it all out at that point. But, mm. you know, it, it feels like that weight should be there. I mean, I also like the Yoda reaction, which is stop beating yourself up about it there's still hope there's still light and that Mm. fits with his more mischievous character but you know when we meet yoda he's very reluctant to teach luke as well and is hiding out kind of for the same reasons and Mm. to me that i don't understand how true star wars fans can kind of get upset about that because that seems to me an element that's been there from the very start in yoda that that weariness not weariness wariness that yeah. the force is force and the, and the danger of teaching people yeah um, so i loved it i mean I, I i had issues with the execution of it and kind of the humor in the film and i know that star wars has always been super funny and i loved it and i love 3po and r2 and han solo and the comedy there and i love the comedy and all the sidekicks so i like the yeah. kind of um the poe dammer and bb8 humor bb8 is brilliantly funny I just felt that with Luke, I don't need Luke to make funny little comments like, oh, yeah, Jakku is a backwater. But why are you here? Let, if Luke's going to have this truly provocative, despairing storyline, he doesn't necessarily, for me, need to have the witty one-liners. They can happen no. in the comic relief scene. So I found that I didn't find Luke's despair jarring. I found his kind of Iron Man humor find, uh, jarring, personally. But did you mind it? Like, you know, the scene where he throws the lightsaber off over his shoulder. I get why they were doing that, because it's a very shocking, powerful image of him rejecting the force. But to mm. me, that felt really uncomfortable. Like, is that really how he would express it? It was almost like in the cinema where I was watching it, people were sort of laughing at it. Uh. Um, it just made me very uncomfortable. But how did you react to all of that? I, I guess I, I see, and this is probably not the right way to do it, but I, I kind of just, I can't separate Mark Hamill with Luke. And Mark Hamill is, his humor is like that. So I wasn't surprised at all that he would do stuff like that. And I found it... Well, make, in any case, for me, it's basically just they're also trying to simulate the whole Yoda on a on a distant planet becoming sort of a like a unlikable hermit to begin with, and ending up being the master that teaches the most important lessons to the 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 new Padawan. Uh, so I understand why they wanted to, to kind of give him that uh, way of being, I mean, humorously 
uncharismatic. Yeah, <laughs> sort of eccentric. He's gone. He's he's lost touch a little bit, and he's yeah. sort of awkward in into because that's probably I guess the first time he's seen a human for quite some time because he's just yeah. living basically with porgs and those weird nun creatures. I kind of get it, and I and I kind of respect the choice they made. It just didn't work for me, mm. and it didn't work for me in quite a violent way. Like it really took me out in the same way that. Leia kind of going out into space and then force using her way back mm. to me was a very jump the shark moment it really took me out because mm. she's always had some force sensitivity so I can see maybe why you can justify that but it just felt like we've never been prepared for her having that power and surviving and it just felt a little bit cheap um so no, not, not in the the regular canon anymore but she does have force powers in the extended universe to a certain extent she was in the in the books she was taught by luke for a, a bit yeah uh, i don't know. know it just so, feels like i mean and i read the eu and i love it yeah. i just feel the eu can give you misdirects as well like why did we get yeah. a whole big phasma book and then phasma gets about two seconds of screen time that's forgettable like, i just feel the films should stand on their own and i think if you'd only watch the films that would be very shocking it was shocking to me actually just to see it mm. i was just like what and the same with like the Jedi mind melds. Like, oh, so live Jedi users can just mind meld and not just talk to Force ghosts. That's the thing. Okay. Mm. <laughs> it's like I get yeah. I get tech moving forward. I get you now have a dreadnought. I get you now have miniaturized Death Star tech and a battering ram and all that bullshit. Mm. But does the Force really progress to a point where there was this cool thing that could happen that we never knew before? Well, I don't think it's a progression, actually. Well, I don't know. I consolidated with my knowledge of Star Wars with the the game. There's a Star Wars Old Republic game, Knights of the Old Republic game, okay. where one of the Force users can use something called battle meditation, where she basically li- links all the uh, the Force users' minds together so that they act in unison on the battlefield. And I thought that that was just... Ah, extended. okay. But again, like if you've never seen it, if you've never played that game, Game. it's like what yeah. what what and that combined with like the low thing it's like seriously you're rewriting the rules of the force and then even like so is there precedent in the eu for luke being able to sort of astral project to a whole different planet and no. interact with people uh, not, not <laughs> as far as i know but again i think that was basically why supreme leader snoke was able to do it to begin with like connect those two because you know there was also the whole aspect of was it, yeah, I think it was uh, Kylo got got wet from the spray of the water or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they kind of introduced it that way so that it wouldn't be so jarring when Luke did it. Uh, I kind of like, I mean, I don't mind that Luke does it because I think, A, it's a beautiful ending. Like, I thought that was a beautiful ending for his character. It was genuinely yeah. shocking. The idea that he's at peace, he's not going to be a Jedi cut down in anger in a fight. Mm. He's actually going to have conquered his own anger and despair and die on his own terms. Mm. And I love the fact that he he got a goodbye with Carrie Fisher, that beautiful handholding scene, and yeah. and that he is a Jedi who, up until Rey and Kylo, is the most powerful one, and that he can do something maybe the other Jedi's couldn't. I mean, I love all that. That it's yeah. not a problem for me, but it was just like, it just felt like that and a few other things together were like, oh, so the rules of the Force are being changed now. Okay, <laughs> definitely, definitely. I'm thinking that, but also, it's also important for me at least to see an evolution of of all the aspects that you like. It's not. It, or at least, yeah, you could do that. Evolve the force powers, make them uh, add more on. But you can also, and a counterpoint for that could probably also be that you could just find new and ingenious ways to use the already existing force powers. I agree. Uh, I agree. So, I mean, there's two camps in that. I think. To me, it all comes down to: is does it forward the narrative? Does it serve the narrative? And I think. Mm. Luke using those new powers very much advances the narrative and gives us real emotional resonance in some scenes. And to me, that that makes it good. I think the Leia kind of getting knocked out of the ship, but being alive, but in a coma, only exists so that Holdo can be given power and be in opposition to Poe. Yeah. So it was kind of like... It's, that felt to me a bit more like we needed some plot tech to make this character yeah. necessary. So that felt a bit cheaper. In right and I agree that that is actually, I mean, of the, those two ex, uh, expressions of, of the Force, I enjoy Luke's much better, or much more than I do with the uh, Leia's. Also, just because I was expecting her to die, because, well, we know, we know that Carrie Fisher is dead, and, and what, what's going to happen next episode uh, of Star Wars? Yeah, so it was a great subversion. <laughs> but I like that even though they didn't kill her, they did give... Ryan Johnson, as a director, does like his um, close-ups on people's faces, and he chose good actors, which is good. 
And there mm. was a beautiful kind of goodbye scene between Leia and Holdo and then another between Leia and Luke. And as it turns out, which is a brilliant surprise for us, it's Holdo and Luke that are the ones that die. But it still yeah. gives you, as someone who comes to the film knowing that Carrie Fisher is dead, this beautiful goodbye. Yeah. And and I felt that was really elegant. Like, And, mm. and also, I just think... Compared to the first movie, they really figured out her hair and makeup and she looks so beautiful in this film, so regal mm. and carries that burden of, of carrying on the resistance. And I just thought it was a magisterial regal performance for her. I really, really loved it. Mm. Um, which I guess brings us to, so we've done Ray and Luke. So the final plot strand is kind of Ray and Kylo mm. force connecting and then her voluntarily going um, to face Snoke and I think that to me this as Song of Ice and Fire fans this really re- reminded me of Melisandre because both mm. Ray and Snoke misinterpret visions so Ray mm. sees Kylo killing Snoke and thinks oh he's going to turn to the light side I need to make that happen and mm. Snoke sees him cutting down his quote unquote greatest enemy which actually turns out to be Snoke so it kind mm. of made me laugh that both of them had sort of misinterpreted Kylo's future and feelings and you end up with Kylo as supreme leader how did you like yeah. that whole story arc yeah i i uh, i was sitting at the edge of my seat wondering what was going to happen because i couldn't figure it out and that's that's good movie making right there yep. i mean I, i'm usually try i usually am able to figure storylines out quite quickly because i i immerse myself in in the the art of doing that in role playing and other stuff so uh, so to not to be able to actually figure out what was going to happen in the end and how to do it that that is a very good sign uh, right there the when when we ended up with the whole where he described that he that that Kylo wanted to cut himself they cut his greatest enemy down by that moment uh, I had figured out that oh really I I totally yeah. didn't the first time I watched it I totally had not figured that out and well, it was just yeah brilliantly surprising <laughs> well, it's also something about camera angles yeah you saw him and and you could see the 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 lightsaber uh right next to him and i i, I kind of figure out that yeah in he, in the in more. the best darth darth vader moment uh, <laughs> he would betray his master and then uh, we get like probably one of the all-time greatest lightsaber battles with kylo and yeah. ray versus all the first supreme leader's hands against this very kind of you know very simple red backdrop for star wars it's it's almost like something out of kurosawa it's yeah. so good <laughs> yeah definitely i mean i really really enjoy uh the the, the color choices of the, this movie i mean going from from these bright bright red uh backdrops from from the uh first order and and the white, uh, almost super clean uh, backdrops from the resistance ships, and then you go to uh, the the casino planet where it's gold black and, and black and white. Yeah. And so all those color choices are really really make me enjoy it from a from a cinematic uh, perspective. I agree, and I really loved what I call the Helm's Deep scene, where they're in the rebel base at the end with the giant door, and yeah. this idea to have the the layer of white salt on the red earth. Yes. Was was number one? It's visually stunning as you see the mm. red reveal. But number two, there's this great theme in this film. One of them is about learning from failure and humility, mm. but another one is about the true cost of war. And, you know, Finn is seeing that through seeing arms dealers and we're seeing slavery. But we're also through Leia's grieving reaction to seeing that bomber fleet destroyed early on. You know, the cost, like she's looking at screens and seeing people die. And I think seeing that pristine white in front of that gate become progressively more red and yeah. slushy and, and almost like bloody is yeah. a beautiful visual metaphor for, the. you know, we, we love this battle between light and dark, but there's this human cost and... I think that's what this film is trying to tell us. There's this real yeah. stakes to this. And I loved how that was communicated visually. So beautiful. Yes, yes basically, most of the lesson we as viewers are supposed to learn is the same uh, lessons that Poe Dameron is going through. That, exactly. That this Star Wars isn't just uh, people, uh, you know, these paragons going gung-ho into uh, the, the den of the den of evil and this, you know, winning at the end uh it's 
there's also a lot of sacrifices that until now hasn't really been addressed too much and that this is basically Hoth but but for me it's bloody yeah. Hoth yeah exactly it's, bloody Hoth. it's it's Hoth with all the wages and all the earnings of battle visually mm. seen which yeah. is fantastic so yeah yeah great I like that <laughs> that's a positive ending to this because I feel that my reaction was so puzzled when I came out. And like I said, there were things that I really don't like. Choices that for me just don't work in this film. Luke having that level of humor, some of the forced choices. Mm. To me, Canto Bite, I just felt was redundant. Mm. And Benicia Del Toro, just, I mean, I don't mind him as a character. It just felt like that whole thing I could have lost. Mm. Um, there were lots of things that really pulled me out of this movie and made me really not like it. Mm. But then again, there are things that I think are beautiful and are so in keeping with the Star Wars universe and so visually brilliant and moving that i loved it and the messages of it are fantastic so, yeah. yeah also just that we can talk so much about all these different aspects and and have a very discussion about why it was there also from from a narrative way but also what what effect it has on the world and and what we feel about those effects that there are so, this it takes so long just to think about all the aspects and all the the scenes and how they affected one is for me a sign of a good movie a very good movie uh, I agree I, like... I agree and I think there are to me there are three fantasy universes that I'm deeply invested in mm. one is Star Wars one is Lord of the Rings mm. and the third is the Song of Ice and Fire and I think that's what all three of them have in common is they they really bear the weight of mm. profound discussion and you can have differing opinions about how they're shown on screen but they're just these beautiful universes to get lost in and like yeah. like i said when i came out it wasn't my favorite film i had problems with it but any star wars film makes me happy and uh. and i think a lot of these and these are bold choices and we talk about this a lot in the context of a song of ice and fire that mm. a lot of us had problems with the dance with dragons um the latest yeah. installment there but until you see the payoff you can't really judge it no. So, and I, but I am looking forward because I know the the final episode is directed by J.J. Abrams. So it's going to be interesting to see whether, you know, Ryan Johnson overturned a lot of what he did. So is yeah. is J.J. Abrams then going to respect that and carry it forward? I'd almost, even though I enjoyed this film less, I'd almost rather Ryan Johnson was doing the next one to see truly where his vision was kind of getting to. Yeah. And that's kind of I mean, the weirdness of these trilogies directed by lots of different people, I think. Yeah, and I I definitely appreciate that he tried something new and something different with this universe uh, in a main nine film just so that we can reflect on on the universe from a different perspective um yeah it's just i commend him for his effort and even though yes there were a few things that were were puzzling why why it was done in that specific way um the whole of the movie and its effect on people's discussion of star wars as a whole but also just as of the saga uh, evolution is makes it a, makes it worth it i think he he did a did, did a very good job um hoping to see more from him what well, he will right because he's been given a new trilogy by kathleen kennedy in the star wars universe so we're going to get mm. a lot of ryan johnson star wars stuff coming up very um, good i think on balance like to me the the negatives were probably weighing on me more than the positives but it still isn't a negative review i mean i still think this is a very interesting fascinating film in the franchise and you know i enjoyed the force awakens more but maybe this is in some respects the more provocative and therefore the better film um it mm. stayed with me it's asked you you know the first one was a much easier watch because it was what we had experienced before so mm. it slipped down very easy like baby food whereas mm. this one is more adult fare and needs a bit more chewing over so that's no bad thing either mm. but then again you don't really in comparison to what i could have expected uh from a person that had more felt it negatively to begin with I, you don't express it you haven't expressed it that much you're uh, my negativity no yeah. i did i mean i did on kind of like you know the facebooks when i first came out of the film because yeah. the negative the shock the negative shock is what stays with you most yeah. immediately and then i think the positives like the structural integrity of it is what comes through later and i think that 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 is the reason why i watched this first a week ago now and it, there's mm. a reason why it took me a week both to write my review and to talk about it mm. because i really wanted to let it settle watch it again and i'm sure as as the years evolve i'll think about it differently too but um, it wasn't the immediate, I love this, that Rogue One was, but, you know, it, it's just mm -hmm. a complicated and long film, and it's a complicated yeah. and long reaction. 
<laughs> so do you, so do you agree that there's quite a possibility that it, like in reverse of how you reacted to the Force Awakens, where you start out, and I'm personally also started out being very positive and very happy when I came out of the 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 cinema, and then started realizing that. Well, this is yes. This is the reason why I liked it was because it's basically the first, <laughs> the the first uh, number four of uh, you know, the, what the movies has already made. It was basically a new hope. Uh, no, I think the difference is is that I realized it was a new hope even when I was watching it, and okay. I was and I was loving it for that very consciously, mm-hmm. and I was loving that J.J. Abrams had taken the time to show me that he loved a new hope, and that was very mm-hmm. instantaneous. So okay. the fan servicey stuff that I don't like about it, I didn't like about it from the start. But it was like, to me, that was like a 90% I love it and 10% I, it is. A bit, and it's kind of like almost like a self-criticism. I wanted this fan service and I've got what I wanted. So mm. I'm an idiot, right? But mm. <laughs> whereas I feel that with Star Wars The Last Jedi, it's been 50-50, like really mm. 50-50 from the start. Okay. And it's just I've expressed the negative publicly first and now I'm expressing it more nuanced. But but we'll see. We'll yeah. see. And I think, honestly, like, if, if this really pays off in the final act, maybe, like, Empire, this will become something that I like even more because we'll see the fruits of it. I just want to see in the final one, all these all these sidekicks like 3PO and R2 and Chewie, who don't really have a point now that their masters are dead, need to go. Mm. And, and these new characters need to come to the floor for, and we need to have that. This trilogy will be ultimately judged on that Rey-Kylo conflict in the last film. Yeah. And what outcome they decide to give to it. Yeah. And until then, everything else is on hold, I think, a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I basically, I, I though, I started out maybe 90% liking The uh, Force Awakens and then going maybe down to 50% because of all the, because I actually didn't enjoy watching it several times uh, that much um, because of the, it was, seemed like I already watched that movie like a hundred times. I, I enjoyed it less. And this one, the more I reflect upon it, the more I like it. And uh, Oh, that's good though. That's really cool. I'm, I'm glad you're getting more and more out of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think we uh, managed to do a very... Balanced. Yeah, balanced. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad we came to a kind of a, a sort of a response that's positive and um, cool. Well, thank you very much for joining, Patrick. If you want to hear more of Patrick, as I said, check out VOK Vassals of Kingsgrave. And other than that, on with the show. Here's a quick clip from Brigsby Bear before I review that film. Everything's very big. It's really very big. <laughs> The reason you're here, the reason I'm here, is all just to help you. Everyone says they're trying to help me, but nobody can find me in the new episode of Brigsby. There wasn't a new episode this week. This is about moving on with the rest of your life. Try to imagine a hero. Just be normal, all right? Uh. Hi, I'm James. I really like your clothes. <laughs> He's not on the bad side. He's on the good side. Brigsby Bear is a really heartwarming, dark comedy that has elements of great films such as Napoleon Dynamite, Room and Be Kind Rewind. It's about a young man called James, who's played by Saturday Night Live's Carl Mooney, who is returned to his family after being abducted as a child and raised by a couple of cranks, the father of which is played by Mark Hamill. He's really struggling to adjust to reality, which you would absolutely imagine is true. And he actually misses the cocooned world in which he lived. And part of the ruse by which his fake parents kept him in that world was to proclaim that the world was a very dark and dangerous place. And they did this or reinforced these messages by creating a completely fake TV show called Brigsby Bear. And... When he gets out of his enforced prison, James is absolutely shocked that no one else has seen Brigsby Bear. He is utterly ingrained in the mythos of it. He's its number one audience member and superfan. And with the help of a friendly cop played by Greg Kinnear, he manages to get back a lot of the costumes and stage scenery that his fake parents had used. And together with his newfound high school friends, he manages to recreate the show, which is very key to his emotionally accepting his past and finding a place in his new family. I found the film to be really laugh out loud funny and very goofy and I thought the cameo from Mark Hamill as the fake dad was really funny. But beyond a kind of Napoleon Dynamite indie movie humour, 
I thought the film was really insightful about the modern nature of internet fueled fandom. And in the words of LCD Sound System, the quote, fake nostalgia for an unremembered 80s that South Park recently so brilliantly satirised with its member berries plotline. Because James is not just someone who watched Briggs be Bear, he has kept them all on meticulously labelled VHS tapes. He discusses the shows in online forums that his fake parents have faked up and become fake people that he chats with. And he even wears like a fake faded fan t-shirt from Briggs be Bear. And so much of the way in which he's been sucked into that fandom mirrors the worst excesses of what Patrick and I and many others experience with our online fandoms when we get really involved in nitpicking shows and obsessed with plot twists and characters. So I think it really speaks to the way in which current generations really get immersed in self-consciously old school lo-fi pop culture and I like the fact that this film is both funny and actually quite moving, but contains a little bit of social satire too. So I'd really strongly recommend Brigsby Bear. It's got a running time of 97 minutes and it's rated PG-13. It opened earlier this year in the USA and Canada and is open as of last week in the UK and Ireland. Now for something completely different, here's a little clip from the Boston Marathon bombing movie, Stronger. Listen up. This young lady here is running the marathon for bringing a women's hospital. So skip around to Stella and donate to a good cause. Yay! I'm going to be there at the finish line for you. I'm going to make a big sign for you. It doesn't show up for anything. <laughs> and then he shows up. There was an explosion, and your legs, they're gone, bro. Welcome home. Is it good to be back? <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, talking to you. What are you doing? Dancing. You try and make a hero out of me. You need to tell your family what's going on with you. So Stronger is the new film from a director I really admire called David Gordon Green. It's a biopic of Jeff Bauman, who was a young man who went to support a friend of his who was running in the Boston Marathon and had his legs blown off in the bombing. He was captured in a very iconic photograph being wheeled off in a wheelchair um, by a man in a cowboy hat and became a kind of symbol of triumph and adversity. You would hear people using the phrase Bauman Strong as well as Boston Strong. And he was quite literally wheeled out at big sporting events after the bombing, waving the American flag and seen as a symbol of um, a city triumphing over adversity. But actually behind the scenes, what we get in this film is a picture of a man really struggling to come to terms with his new disability, his struggle just to walk again, to be in his mother's flat and to use the bathroom and really basic stuff. And also the struggle that his girlfriend Erin has in putting her life on hold and her job on hold to become his carer when she doesn't get on with a mum. And when his girlfriend becomes pregnant, Jeff's reluctance to both accept the public role as the symbol of this crisis, but also to accept the private role of being a dependable boyfriend and father. So it's a relatively straightforwardly told film, deceptively so actually. I think Jake Gyllenhaal gives a really strong performance as Jeff Bauman. I think he totally conveys the frustrations and the conflicted feelings about having to deal with this deeply traumatic thing in a very public manner. I felt a little sorry for Tatiana Maslany, who I think is a very talented actress, obviously from Orphan Black, the TV show. I think she has very little to do in this film except just be supportive and be on the verge of tears. And I found the rest of the cast slightly odd in a sense. Miranda Richardson, the great British actress, uh, plays Jeff's alcoholic mum. And I'm not sure if anyone from Boston is listening to this and can attest to whether her accent is convincing, but I just felt it was... uh, a little a little phony, a little obviously off. And it just felt that David Gordon Green was probably trying to 
portray that kind of loud, obnoxious extended family that we see in other very famous Boston films such as The Fighter or even pastiched, hopefully self-consciously, in the TV show Wahlburgers. But it just kind of felt flat here and I feel I've seen that too often. Even if that was the real thing, I feel that it was shown in a way that just felt cliched rather than authentic and real. I think the real star of, of the film actually or well, the really interesting part of the film is how Jeff connects with the guy who actually was wheeling him out in the cowboy hat. And that particular man's story is incredibly moving and became for me perhaps the most authentic and moving part of the film, despite the fact that it's meant to be about Jeff Bauman. And so while it's by no means a perfect film and there were the things about it that brought me out of the viewing experience... I was actually crying by the end of watching it. And I think the emotional payoff is worth some of the more unsuccessful directorial choices. That said, I watched it knowing very little about Jeff Bauman. And since then, I have read the book on which the film was based. And what's fascinating about that is that the book is very slippery about what I've now discovered are great controversies about Jeff Bauman, principally about what he remembers, how he remembered it, how he ID'd the bomber from the photo, and also about the sheer amount of money that has been donated to him and the ethics around some of that. Yes, I just wish that maybe the film had had the bravery to tackle some of those controversies in a head-on manner and more transparently than the book did, because I think then you would have had a truly gritty film with real insight rather than what is ultimately a feel-good movie, bizarrely, right? I mean, it shows you Jeff Bauman battling against being a symbol of hope, but ultimately this is a movie about him being a symbol of hope and that's the message we're meant to get. And it's also slightly bizarre that you end the film with him being, you know, basically in a good place. Like he's learned to walk again, he's found some purpose, he's with the beautiful Erin, he has a, a baby... And yet we know as the viewers that he's since been divorced. So there's something just slightly off about the film. I think it does work emotionally despite that. David Gordon Green's just a good enough filmmaker that that's going to be the case. Um, It's worth a watch. It's not necessarily the greatest film ever made. Um, Stronger has a running time of 116 minutes. It was open earlier this year in the USA and was released in the UK on December 8th. And I still think it's worth checking out if you need something to watch at the cinema. Okay, so that's been an extended edition of being a 007 movie reviews. I think Star Wars is the big film. I hope you guys really enjoy it when you go see it. Brigsby Bear, definitely worth checking out if you want that side dish of art house Mark Hamill. And whatever you choose to watch over the Christmas holidays, I hope you have fun watching it. I hope you have a great holiday season. And I look forward to speaking with you all in the new year. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 